Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 281 of Real Blend, a podcast that is celebrating the end of the WGA strike. Congratulations to all of our writer friends out there who settled on a deal and can now get back to work. They are back to work as we speak, as we are now uh, recording this week's podcast. Next up, SAG-AFTRA. Come on, industry. Let's go. Let's get everybody back on the same page. Pay your actors. Yes. On this week's show, we're reviewing three movies uh, that are going to be hitting theaters and streaming this week, including The Creator uh, by Gareth Edwards, Saw X and John Carney's new film, Flora and Son. And in light of that... We have director John Carney joining us uh, to discuss his new film and a ton of music talk because John Carney loves music. And if you've seen any of his films, Sing Street and Once uh, and Begin Again, I'm a huge John Carney fan. Uh, This is going to be a really fun interview for you guys to dive into. My name is Sean O'Connell. I am the managing editor uh, of Cinema Blend and a co-host of the Royal Blend podcast alongside my great friends, Starting with Kevin McCarthy of Fox Five in Washington D.C. Hello, Kev. Hi, Sean. I uh, noticed your hat. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, and as, as well as the uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning T-shirt that you're wearing. I, I actually would like to know how many promo shirts you think you have from over the years because you've been doing this for about 80 90 years now i think <laughs> so i'm just wondering like do you still have yes. like do you, he do has you have, the citizen do you kane have touch this, of evil yeah I was gonna say, citizen kane when's the like, lumiere brothers uh anniversary it's about that long. <laughs> <laughs> instead of passion of the christ merch i actually have christ's robe <laughs> <laughs> the shroud of turin <laughs> he gave it to me afterwards after the junket um i I mean, I've had hundreds. As far as <laughs> Sean, Sean did the junket for the Bible. I like, did. <laughs> like the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down, I got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sean got the rap on the third commandment. <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. I'm old. I get it. Um, and Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Feeling pretty spicy today, Jake, aren't you? I didn't start that shit. Kevin did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and go, Gabe Kovach in the producer's chair. Hello, Gabe. How are you? Doing? I'm good. I'm good. The youngest Sorry, person on the show. Yes. yes. I've never met Jesus once. We have, uh, well, you're missing out. He's he's a good guy, JC. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you very much for joining us. Please head down, give us a like and a subscribe. Join us here each week for your audio listeners. If you want to join us in video form, head to youtube.com backslash real blend podcast. What a weird start to the show. It was an odd start to the show, but that's all right. We're going to rebound. We're going to get the train back on track. What do you um, mean? I thought it was great. That was <laughs> kind of great. But, and, and, and all nearly 300 episodes. I don't think it's that we've ever taken in that tangent before <laughs> which which of us have met jesus a junket for the for the ten commandments <laughs> you don't think we ever had that <laughs> it was me and pat stoner <laughs> uh, that's an inside joke that patrick would love oh, for sure man. uh mm. have you signed up for real blend premium you can get an ad-free version of the podcast and a newsletter from myself every other friday this is a newsletter week game no no this is not last week i had a newsletter So um, when you guys listen to next week's episode, you'll have a newsletter waiting for you in your inbox. So check in the description for information on where you can sign up. Okay, as we mentioned, the WGA is back uh, and not that the wheels are turning instantly, but it does feel like we have a bunch of interviews that are either uh, on the radar or or that we've just completed. We completed a a very exciting one right before recording this episode. We will tease that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, But a couple of weeks ago, now at this point, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, um, we got to sit down with John Carney. John Carney has a new film coming out called Flora and Son. I was able to see it up at the Toronto International Film Festival. Kev, you saw it at home. Is that correct? Yeah, I loved it. Before getting him? Yeah, I was, I'm very excited that we had him on our show. This is a really great conversation. Um, and, and I can't stress this enough. If you haven't seen Sing Street began again once, um, this is an extraordinary filmmaker. And one of the things that Sean points out in this interview, which I think is interesting, is about the long haul of his box office and 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 the way his films find audiences. Like he admittedly talked about the idea of not having huge opening weekends, right? And and how that goes. So this is uh, this is a really great conversation. 
and I'm really excited for people to hear it. And I, I don't know. I love this movie. Just kind of, I needed it. And we're going to review it on the other side, but mm -hmm. I'm very, very happy we have him on our show. I've never actually talked to him before this. So he had I'm great energy in this interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one of the, yeah. We, we always have a good time in interviews, but he just had a lot of good energy where he was like, I think someone asked like, are you pretentious about music? And he goes, Yes, he goes, let me yes. tell you what, why I'm pretentious about music. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll hear all about that and plenty more in our Real Blend interview with John Carney on behalf of the new film, Flora and Son. So without further ado, here's John Carney joining the show. Really happy to have you on. All three of us are huge fans of your work and really excited to talk about this movie. But um, I kind of want to discuss there. There are some different uh, musical styles that you play around with uh, in Flora and Son. I'm curious how have your own musical tastes sort of evolved uh, from film to film to bring you to what you're exploring here in this new movie? Uh, good question. I mean, I'm I'm constantly evolving, you know, in terms of taste and, you know, I remain firmly i don't want to be that old man giving out to my kids saying it's not the rolling stones son or whatever you know i just don't want to be that guy that my dad was <laughs> i want to get with the sheerans and the swifts and the be all that stuff and i want to be hip and cool i'm very open <laughs> but uh, yeah i look at these films as like character studies and i try to try to find i try to let the characters tell me what music they should be creating um and not the other way around, you know, not enforce my musical tastes on the movie. But that's I, interesting. You no, know, I have to like the songs because otherwise the movie will grate on me when I'm when I'm. But I don't have to. That you know, it's not my type of music that I'm trying to impose on 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 the audience or anything like that. So you know, this one is you know, once was going to be folksy. It was going to probably be acoustic. Begin Again felt like it was going to be kind of light piano pop, makes sense, singer-songwriter mm. vibe. Mm. It's going to be, you know, derivative sounding, not quite parodies, but to begin with maybe, but then developing its sound, the 80s stuff that I grew up on. Mm -hmm. This one was a bit different. This one was took a little bit longer to locate what the film would sound like with these three crazy characters mixing together to create a new sound. Mm. You know, Sean had mentioned that we're, that we're a podcast that's focused on filmmakers and, and the process. So I want to dive into some of the filmmaking choices and the narrative uh, shot choices that you did in the film um, to set this up for the audience is a really cool bit in this film. So basically Flora's character is trying to get these guitar lessons. She meets Joseph Gordon Levitt through the internet. Uh, and there's these beautiful moments where She's playing during the uh, lessons and the camera basically will start behind her or, or showing her and you'll go around her and eventually Joseph Gordon-Levitt will appear in person even though he's thousands of miles away. But you do a lot of cool things in that, the shot itself, but also the audio change. You'll go from the audio of a computer sound to the actual audio of someone being in person. Can you discuss the narrative choices behind that and kind of what you wanted to get across with that and kind of maybe how you design those shots? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm they're 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 um they're my visual way of of trying to track what's going on with the story, which is that she's getting lost in this relationship, and she's when he's when he plays, she is starting to go, whoa, I didn't think of music in that way. So they're my kind of visual, you know, way of doing that, but they're also kind of within my wheelhouse of like lo-fi. Don't let's not let's not like. I mean, I did think for a second, like, is there a CGI thing that I could do? Um, or could he climb out of the screen, you know, foot first? <laughs> <laughs> True, but then I was like, it's not a Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> I'm tiny or, you know, the lo-fi sort of um, version of that. And I thought, you know, if I was on a cool little theater stage in Brooklyn or something, and I was watching this, we would probably have the actor just sort of walk out or something, or we get to Stratton, and then he would be there. And it would be a lovely moment where you'd feel his footfall on the ground of the thing or something, you know, and it's just, Oh, this is, this is really interesting. And, you know, and you're right. The, the, the fun of it was to try and compose a shot that like, um, felt musical and felt like it was in touch with the music and tune. We did a lot of takes to get those. They're deceptively simple because they, they always take a bit of work to get those things exactly right. 
And then that beautiful sound mix over, as you say, it actually coincided beautifully in that take with Joe hitting a deep, like G, which we, we had the recording in the room. And it really, if you notice it, it really resonates in the room and it like it brings him in. Um, so yeah, no, cool. I, I like those kind of things. And I like them when they're simple. Uh, John, there's a, a fun moment in the film uh, when Joe uh, asks, what's your favorite song? And when she says it's you're beautiful, he goes, no, 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 that can that cannot be your favorite song. And I have a buddy of mine uh, who does that with movies. He'll ask people what's your favorite movie when they say something. He'll go, no, no, that cannot be your favorite movie. Um, I've been there before. I get that. I, I whenever someone says, oh, my favorite movie or TV show is this or that, and I just sort of. But also, you don't want to gatekeep people. You don't want to tell people no, you're not allowed to like this or that. What you obviously know a ton about music. You know a ton about movies. Uh, I'm sort of curious if you've ever been guilty of that. Whenever someone says, oh, I, I love this band or I love this director and you just go, oh, God, no, no, you cannot like them. You clearly haven't met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Carney, we have not met Mrs. Carney. Uh, Mrs. Carney or Glenn Hansard or any of my friends who would answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, <laughs> all the time. Um, and it's not mansplaining. It's like to anybody who listened to me, mm. like. If there's somebody on the tube listening to the wrong music, I'll be like, you know, you're listening to the wrong song there, right? <laughs> In fact, my kids are the only people I spare from it because I'm like, yes, this particular bland New York song from this kid's film, I love. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most enthusiastic thumbs up I've ever seen in my life. Because I just don't want to be my dad. I don't want to be, you know, Oh, that's garbage. And this is not as good as it was in the 70s when there was real no. talk. I don't want to be that guy. But is there, a, uh, is there a popular band or movie that when people tell you that they, they love it, that you just go, oh, oh. God. So many. <laughs> My heart sinks when I hear somebody listening to la 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 da da da. Ba, 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 da, 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 baby, um, da, da, da. ukulele, babyish, infantilized jingles that mm. if you listen to that music and you're like, if this was a children's entertainer in the 90s, you'd be like, oh, that, he's good. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you listen? So. If ever my wife plays that type of music in the, in, the, in, in the house and she says, oh, shut up, lighten up. It's just a song in the background. I'm like, if I brought home a painting of a bull with a naked woman riding on top of it <laughs> and put it up at the end of our bed in our room, you'd say, take that shit down. I don't want to look at it. And I, I'm serious. I'm not, this isn't me being precious. It's bad music. You might as well just like open a rotten egg in the room. It's, it's a thing that's in the room. And it, 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 why would you have, you know, we were talking like you could have a steak, you know, why, if somebody gave you a hamburger and you had a beautiful, rare fillet steak and a glass of wine, I don't think you'd ever pick the hamburger because mm -hmm. it's tasty. You know, when, when the steak isn't there, it's tasty. But as soon as you bring the steak in, you're like, I'm never going to go for the hamburger. It's not <laughs> nourishing. It's not good for me. Right. Um, and it's really how I say it's like I'd be fine with um, with, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? You know, riding in the shotgun, da -da -da -da, top gun, da -da -da -da. that's not a an acceptable melody because mm. it's not if there was nothing else, maybe. But why would you listen to I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun? <laughs> la 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 la. That's for fucking baby. When there's Bill Withers <laughs> over here, right? Very free on YouTube or on Spotify or whatever. It's free. It's right there. I'm not saying like, oh, listen to classical music, son. I'm listening to listen to Sister Sledge or Chic. It's right there. Right. Why, why, why would you, when you can have a Van Gogh in your, in your house, why would you have this piece of shit that is, 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 
this is how annoying I am, guys. And I no, apologize. I li- <laughs> you fit in so well to this podcast. If no, you'd like yes. to be the newest member of this podcast, you you do very well. You need to co-host with us one time, man. Seriously, that'd be amazing. That's, that's what I say about all like the the so many that like the live action Disney remakes. I'm like, when you have the original, why are you watching that? I don't get it. I do not understand it. But 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 so I was able to give my dialogue to handsome, charming Joe Gordon Levitt. It's a lot easier to swallow. <laughs> uh, to that end, John, obviously, it seems like you put as much or if not more focus on the songs that are going to be in your movies, you know, as you might character development. And and I'm curious if you had ever gotten to a point where the music that you were creating for the movie wasn't reaching a certain standard or you were just having a really hard time figuring out that you even might have considered, like, I'm not going to go forward with this story because I'm not getting the right music. Because you're not going to put a, a a cheap bauble, you know, of a tune to, to move it forward. Yeah, I, it's it's always a challenge as well. And it was, it was more so in this film because... Um, um, like, I don't want to have any weak songs in my films, but I do want to have plausible character-driven songs. So sometimes you have to go... Um, this character is not going to produce greatness now because she's, you know, she's a girl from the flats who has eight chords and a beat up guitar, Mm -hmm. but she can produce something that's beautiful for her and for us that now know her. Um, And I, you know, so when I'm slagging off those other songs, it's not that they're simple. Mm -hmm. I don't mind simplicity, but, but, but there's, um, Usually what happens, as we all know, with, you know, all, all we're trying to do as artists is, you know, the, the art that conceals art. That's what I'm, that's what we're about. We don't want to, you know, and all the great artists who were, who, who were simple had to learn how to be great and then to be simple, you know, and, and it's, it's Miles Davis thing is like this three or four notes at the beginning of such and such a, a, a piece, but that's the way he plays those four notes. It's nobody, we don't need more notes. It's the it's the human being right there that we're looking for. Mm-hmm. And in this film, it's not the song. The songs don't have to be awesome. They're songs from Flora. And because we now know her, we kind of feel she's awesome. She's cool. That's cool for a mom to go out mm-hmm. and brave that and stand up in front of a stage and, and begin. It's it's the process. And the you know, the chords are nice and it's all that, but they're not, they're not incredibly intricate, you know songs but they're from her perspective now that we know her it's it's really heartwarming to see her do that Mm -hmm. you know john one of the things i find interesting you know you go back early in your career you were in a band called the frames and i think in the 90s you 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 were also shot some of the videos for the band and you know i obviously i think of sing street a lot because it's one of my favorite movies of all time and the, and the videos that were in that film and yeah. and i just wanted i wanted to ask you like going back to that guy who was playing bass in that band and the and the videos that you were shooting at that time are there lessons on those videos that you still are applying today in these films that you're making? I mean, I, I would imagine there are, but I mean, do you have specific memories of like, oh yeah, I learned how to do this shot or this edit or tell this narrative story because you're telling it in short form there and then you get to tell it long form in a feature. I'm just kind of curious what what you think about those days of your life. Yeah, I mean, I loved pop videos and I really liked kind of messing around and experimenting with ways of doing pop videos that were a bit different, that weren't just performance videos. But I um, I think I parked that for a long time and and then realized like I have I have to know how drama works and humor if I'm to use any of those things in a deep way, like I saw a movie the other day by a, by a, um, a first movie by a guy who was a really great video maker, but the film wasn't good because he hadn't spent enough time, uh, you know, learning how to be funny and to dramatically stage a scene and then use, bring in his music making skills into it. Mm. So I think I parked the music thing for a long, long time and learned, learned about drama. Mm. We, TV show myself and my friends and my wife back in Dublin, where we kind of learned what you need to tell a story, how you can be funny, how you can be dramatic, how to stage a scene. But then I brought in my first love, which is music, hmm. and, you know, being able to 
take a break from the narrative for a second and see and get taken on a different weird journey that only film can bring you i mean only only a movie can just pause and have a song and walk out and go up the stairs with somebody and it's a remarkably beautiful thing when those two things come together um mm. but i file i find like i had to wait a long time to kind of get them right mm. Mm. Uh, John, I love, I'm a sucker for a good needle drop in a movie. Um, mm -hmm. I think about some of my favorites of all time. And a lot of my favorites are in your films. And I'm just sort of curious, as someone who, who knows music and knows movies, do you have a, a favorite needle drop in movie history? Oh, wow. so many. I think P.T. Anderson does it very, very, very well. Um, yeah. A lot. And actually, I find that he's probably being copied now a lot, where it's like, oh, this sounds 1970s-ish, I'll put it on. And it's like, no. His, I actually associate, I knew Supertramp way before I knew P.T. Anderson movies. Like, I listened to Supertramp growing up in the 70s, mm -hmm. or, you know, the 80s. Um, and I, was, I love Supertramp. And then when he used them, I think in, I think he uses them in Magnolia, but he might use a song in Boogie Nights as well. Every time I hear that song, I'm reminded of the P.T. Anderson world because mm -hmm. it's so well dropped into that movie. Um, and it's so clearly not just like a music supervisor saying, hey, Paul, I got a song for you. It's like, no, I, this, <laughs> I built the scene set, setting this song up or this needle drop. And that's amazing. Uh, so when I, you know, and, and that's for Amy Mann and all of the songs in his, in his, in his movies, they're just so married to his, to his films. So he's great. And I'm trying to think of other. I mean, Tarantino. Well, I'll tell, well, actually not so much Tarantino for me. I'll tell you, I was watching the other day. It's not a movie. It's a TV show. I watched an episode of Poker Face. Oh yeah. Oh, Ryan Johnson. Of one of the episodes it was a fucking Steely Dan song. And I was mm -hmm. like love i already liked this show and the whole world of that and then i heard that steely dan song and i hope it wasn't just a supervisor giving a needle drop because i think steely dan are really like hard to clear mm. and it seems like a very specific use of a, of a needle drop and it just made me smile um john i was reading in some interviews from the sundance premiere of the film uh that eve was apparently terrified to sing on screen and it's so crucial to her character. You know, obviously you can't cast somebody unless they feel comfortable doing it. How do you even approach that? <laughs> how do you help her feel comfortable? Uh, how do you get her to the place where you need her to be so that it works for the character? Yeah, it was it, it was it was funny that because it was like she did ask that question. She's like, how am I going to do this? And geez. on the first day of filming, myself and Eve kind of came together and had a chat off camera a little bit of, you know, we, you, you usually like learn so much on the first day mm -hmm. and it's very important to like consolidate like at lunchtime or halfway through or at the end of that first day when you're like, shit, this isn't going to get any better than what we did today. You know, it, it's not suddenly, we're not going to suddenly magically find the, 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 the answer to the problems that we found on the first day, we have to talk now and we have to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. You know, one of them was we didn't want to make a social drama in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like we want to come off as, um, oh, Flora from the flats, if only she behaved correctly. And we didn't want it to be gritty to the degree that it was like we were trying to do a social thing or a Ken Loach movie or something like that. Mm -hmm. That we want to do a comedy, a colorful, like David O. Russell style comedy that was like a bit crazy and didn't care about being a political or social film. That was a really big decision. But the other one was Flora's never going to like belt out and be incredible on stage. Let's like have her flawed. Let's have her out of tune. And, and and Eve was like brilliant because I, I, she really doesn't want to feel like she's like stepping in her dad's shadow or something like that mm -hmm. um, who happens to have the best rock voice in the world right? Uh, and I, and that was a crucial thing for her and also for me you know I don't didn't want her to sing and it's like oh my god if only 
Flora had followed her dream that she'd be winning 50 Grammys. No, she's just a mom singing around the corner in the pub. And she's she's not dying on stage. That was the that was all. She's not fucking, you know. Right. A cat being skinned. Yeah. <laughs> Hold a tune. She can sing reasonably well. And she's telling the truth. She's telling her truth about her son. And she's singing at the level that's true to her. Mm. Doesn't go off and do a Mariah Carey 50 notes in a, in a word thing, which is, <laughs> you know, it's not, that's not what it's about. Or try to be like Bono or a female version of Bono or whatever, Bono or whatever, you know, she, she made the right call on that. That's smart. You know, John, there's a great moment in the film where Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character sends Flora track for Joni Mitchell's both sides, which is uh, I think it's funny, I, like on a personal level, there there are times in your life when you hear a song and it just wrecks you. Um, like I was at the chiropractor the other day and there was a song playing in the room and I just started crying. I don't know what I don't know what that says about me, but sometimes songs just hit you at the right time. And there's this beautiful character arc that she goes through as she's listening to the song and it's all in her face. It's a really beautiful performance from a, an acting moment. I was just wondering, do you have moments in your life where a song hit you at the right time emotionally that helped you work through something that you were maybe were dealing with or something that wasn't kind of like had come to the surface yet? Because I think obviously songs have that ability, but also timing is a huge part of it. So I just wondered, like, do you have a Flora moment like that for yourself where someone sent you something and it kind of hit you at the right time? Yeah, it's what my whole music musical upbringing was, was brothers and sisters and friends playing you things. And I think it's why it's so resonant, those, that stuff on the internet where you see people listen to things for the first time, which I frankly think is a bit weird, but I, I you know, we, we, they're, the, they're the incredible moments in life. They're all the, I don't, you know, they're all the musical moments to me in life is somebody curating something and putting something into context. That's why these algorithms never fucking work for me in movies or songs. I don't care what a computer thinks I like. I couldn't, what Mark Zuckerberg thinks or any of those tech guys, I don't give a damn. But if, <laughs> if somebody that you know puts something in context and you don't need that much context, you know, the way you watch a new movie or a movie that you thought you'd seen three times, just because one person said something about Gene Hackman and you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. And then suddenly because a human being that you respect or are interested in makes you, and you're like, this is a brilliant film. And you're like, yeah, it was always there. I just didn't want to watch it without the context. And I think music, new music being revealed to you in that way, seems to be, you know, you're not just on your own putting on records all the time. I mean, there's moments of that in life, but generally I think, is it fair to say that somebody said, oh, you'll, I'll tell you about this song and put it on or, you know, and gives you a bit of context. But yeah, like I've had tons of those Flora moments where um, where I've been like slow, like beat up by listening to something. I mean, Kentucky Avenue by Tom Waits would be the main one. Mm -hmm. like, you remember the moment you heard that for the first time? I actually do. I, my, a colleague of mine played, Tom Hall played that song to me. We were just listening to records in his house and I played a Tom Waits record to him. And he said, oh, have you heard this? I think it's on Swordfish Trombones. And he put it on. And because I was with a dude, I listened to it and it was like, I knew it was speaking to me in such a deep way that I, I had to wait to get home on my <laughs> own to process it. So I was like, that's a really good song. <laughs> I was like burning to listen to it and just pour crying at it because it is a you know I don't know if you know that song Kentucky Avenue it's like it's this beautiful kind of jazz piano chords with a list of reflections and fleeting images of childhood in a kind of a semi Charles Bukowski poetic sort of um, nostalgic Huckleberry Finn sort of wave of memories and it mm. never says it's like a dying man or it's like it's just childhood to these chords it is i challenge all three of you to listen to it without crying <laughs> i and tried after this at the end of a tv show we had a joke about that that we did where kentucky avenue ends the, a tv series that myself and my friends did it's the last needle drop and 
and somebody puts it on and says, uh, we won't be able to listen to this without crying. And they all cry. It's kind of like a male bonding sort of like moment where they don't want to admit that they're crying and then they're all crying. And it's kind of a funny scene, but it's true. You can't listen to Kentucky Avenue without being a wreck. Well, you know, well, I'm I'm like that with uh, with a lot of your films. In fact, I watched this one with with my girlfriend, who over our time together has learned that I'm a much bigger crybaby crybaby than I think she realized. And and about three quarters of the way through this film, she looked at me and goes, "Are you crying?" And I was like, "No, I'm not crying. Leave me alone." <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about your casting process because uh, it goes without saying that you have a long history of actors in your films who do have really great voices. So, in your casting process, are you looking for actors? who can sing well, or are you looking for singers who can act well? So that is a, a perfect question. The, on, uh, in Once, it was singers that could act, that, that, that I could manage to wrestle a performance out of. But first and foremost, when those guys start singing and playing, it's got to be the best. It's like jazz. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to be absolutely blowing the trumpet. You can't fake it. Mm -hmm. Um then on begin again you know it changes it's it's sometimes you need the acting chops mm -hmm. and sometimes you need the singing thing and uh so it's changed for 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 different movies like in sing street all those kids had to be able to perform mm -hmm. you know that music had to just be second nature to them the acting i could probably figure out a little bit um but then in flora it was about the acting first and foremost mm -hmm. And, and I felt like this isn't about geniuses, singer, singers in the way that, you know, Falling Slowly is clearly just such a beautiful song. This this needed to be about the truth of the characters. So, you know, you, you just need, you need, you know, the, the best of the best there. And Eve and Joe and people like Jack Rayner and this year, Ed Orr, and they're just you know, terrific actors, first and foremost. John, I'll get you out of on this because we're running out of time. Um, but... I think you belong on this list. Uh, I think all three of us would say this, that whenever we hear that there's a new John Carney movie, we circle it. We're basically saying like, can't wait to see what you do next. We've loved all your films up to this point. You haven't necessarily had like a, a, a smash hit opening weekend, like a Michael Bay type thing. But what instead what happens with your films is that they come out word of mouth powers them because everyone talks about how great they are and they continuously grow this legion of of supporters essentially from you know of course with once sing street you know everybody talks about sing street now at this point i yeah. don't i don't doubt it's going to happen with flora and son um how satisfying is that you know to know that that eventually you you keep picking up new audience members and and that your filmography lives on because people keep passing it to people who are saying, oh, you have to sit down and watch Begin Again. It's terrific. It's, you know, or, you know, and, and keep keep re referring people to new people to your films. I think it's all I've got, really, if I'm being honest. You know, I think that the the um, that is the 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 thing that I set out to do, not. Not that I wouldn't like a nice opening weekend or to have my films make more money or be more of a kind of bona fide hit or something mm. like that. But just that really my 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 as you may have noticed in the last half an hour of speaking, like my purpose and what I really believe in 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 music and films is like exactly what you just said is like something that reaches people eventually. It doesn't have to like, you know, reach everybody in a cinema at the same time. There's something else in in those movies um, that I hope, particularly young people, actually will will get something real out of, mm. and feel like that the movies are not just pieces of fluff, but they are fluffy and fun. They can be entertaining, but there's just something in them that but that 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 was. Um, that in some way, you know, affects people in the way that I was affected by a few core movies when I was a kid that I felt like spoken to by somebody. And it wasn't always like the Spielberg movies or the big movies. Sometimes it was like very obscure indie American movies or a French film or something that just like, oh, thank God. Like that film's like, it's useful to me. I can replay it. It actually has a has a kind of purpose in my life. Mm -hmm. Sing Street's a good case in point, like for 10 years or nine years now, that movie has collected. Um, you know, if I could concertina that into the first week, yeah. it would be incredible. And I'd probably 
lot more backing from producers and stuff like that. But no, it takes a while to roll out and stay the course. Right. Actually, that's the important thing. I mean, I'm sure I love Barbie. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I wonder if it'll stay the course. And when I say the course, I mean like the 10 year course. Right. Who right. knows very well, a very significant movie. But I wonder if you make something um, that does blow up on the first, you know, month, can it, can it, can it be there in 10 years time? I don't know. And I'm not saying I do, but I'm very grateful for you pointing out that I may make some movies that sort of stay the course. And it's why we so often say, well, we say like the Academy Award shouldn't be given out until 10 years after. Right. That's a very very cool thing to say. Yeah, it's exactly Mm -hmm. right. Or 20 surprised years even because some movies languish for 10 or 15. Like, can you imagine being Martin Scorsese and having made King of Comedy? Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. You have made the best comedy, black, dark comedy. Not only is it a brilliant dark comedy. It's a totally original dark comedy. There was to, to Die For hadn't been made. Um, Quentin Tarantino hadn't been funny. Mm. Uh, or, you know, he was Scorsese invented that genre. Mm. And De Niro was a heartthrob, Academy Award winning, beautiful, you know, serious actor with a fucking mustache being Will Ferrell. Yeah, Rupert Pufkin. <laughs> that was super inventive filmmaking at the time you have to go back in your head and remember none none of what we know had been invented yet hmm. it was invented on that movie set and it came out and every fucking critic said this is bullshit right <laughs> and the film bombed and scorsese must have been like give it 20 years guys and he did he wasn't because he's just a human being so he was probably devastated by it right <laughs> right all right right and now it's one of his classics see john we want to have you on as a ho- as a co-host you fit here <laughs> john <laughs> We got to get running, but we thank you so much for your time, John, and congratulations on Flora and Son. We look forward to having you back on the show sometime soon. Anytime. Thanks for the questions, guys. We want to thank uh, our good friend John Carney for coming on the show, and uh, hopefully we get him back for his next picture. Huge fan of his work. Um, uh, Kev, I'm going to get you a chance to come around to Flora and Son. I, I want to mention about um, where I think it fits in, in the uh, John Carney filmography and how... Um, to me, it's at the back of the pack, but only because the other ones are are so good. Um, and the one thing and but this was so interesting to hear him talk about this from this perspective. The one reason why I thought it was a little bit lacking is that the songs weren't as good as the ones in Sing Street, which is really about um, a, a teenage band coming together uh, at a private school and uh, and figuring out how to become a big band and maybe leave Ireland and head over to the UK to to break out and then even begin again with Mark Ruffalo as a struggling um, record ex- executive finding Kira Knightley and running around New York City to figure out how to record this organic album using the sounds of the city. And I really thought the music was terrific. What Carney points out, though, is that this is a story of a woman who's learning how to play the guitar, so she shouldn't naturally be. Uh, great. And when he said that, I was like, oh, OK, I get it. You're right. Um, but this film still lacked it. It, it has a, a moment that's supposed to be like the music shop scene from once uh, where they sit down at the piano and the guitar and they break out falling slowly, um, which to me is a scene that I'll still pull up on YouTube every once in a while and just, you know, cry over. Um, I didn't think it had that. Um, but I did really like the story. I I do think it has enough of his personality, enough of his touch, obviously his passion for music, which you guys saw shine through in the interview. Uh, Kev mentioned Eve Houston, who I think is terrific in it. Jack Rayner has a small part and is also really good. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt has a really difficult part because it's another one of those films that kind of embraces the fact that it took place during a COVID era and where people were connecting with each other via laptop. So Joseph Gordon-Levitt lives far away, but there are times when Carney plays with space and and brings the two of them together. And I thought Joseph Gordon-Levitt did an amazing job of sort of getting his personality to shine through that technology, which can be very difficult to do. Um, So I liked it a lot, um, but I I didn't quite like it as much as I liked his other ones, but only because all of his other ones made my top 10. And I I don't see Florence on making my top 10. Jake, you're kind of nodding. Do you 
feel the same way or yeah i'm i'm with you in that it feels um wrong to call it my least favorite because that feels so much more dramatic than i mean for it to be because i did like the film for sure Mm -hmm. it just felt a little too familiar to me it kind of felt like him making the movie that we know him to make it's almost how i feel like how you often describe the departed Mm -hmm. as like it feels like someone making a martin scorsese movie this feels like someone making one of his movies almost like a you know uh, like a coloring book coloring in you know the the mona lisa like just sort of filling in the holes of of what someone else has already done Mm -hmm. so i still very much liked it but it just kind of felt beat for beat kind of what we've come to expect and i I agree with you um that that in terms of the music which is always such a massive part that is definitely on the weaker end there are a lot of things about it that i liked but it didn't leave me on a cloud nine like uh the rest of his films do and i really don't think it has to do with because we you know kevin and i we watched uh the screener in our homes for the junket and i was thinking back to it and, and this goes back to the christopher nolan conversation we've had I don't think I've honestly seen any of his films in theaters. I think I just, I think I just, I discovered sing street and begin again. And once I think I discovered them at home on DVD or streaming or, or, you know, screener or whatever the case may be. Um, and they've always impacted me in, in a really great way. Um, so, so yeah, I, I like this movie quite a bit, but it definitely feels like, uh, his previous three are on a tier that this one just doesn't reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, this this well, this film is personal for me because I've I've, uh, I've been playing guitar since I was 12. And so like one of the things that's interesting about film criticism is, you know, at the end of the day, like the person who's giving the review, you have to understand that that person is coming from their own life experiences and Mm -hmm. certain things from that film are going to hit that person in a different way. As they should. Right. And so for me, um, my my arc with guitar has been a really interesting thing since I was 12. I've, I, I've consistently played over the years, but then I'll go a few months and dip in and out. Um, I'm a big heavy metal fan. So I like, like I love kill switch engage and bands like slipknot. And so I like, I do a lot of, I play a lot of heavy metal. So mostly I have my electric guitars out. Um, my acoustic guitar, which is a tailor, which I've always wanted a tailor. And I, and, and I, and it was a guitar that I couldn't afford when I was in college that I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm one day I want to buy a tailor. And then I bought one a couple of years ago. Um, and it had been sitting in my office. I'd been playing mostly electric prior. Um, and then when I watched floor and son, uh, it just, it just sparked it again. I literally oh, came cool. home. I that's came awesome. home that day and literally pulled my acoustic guitar out and I tuned it down to drop C, which is what Killswitch Engage uses because they actually have an acoustic track on one of their first albums. And I started strumming along. So what I'll do now because of Floor and Son is I'll sit in front of my TV, watch The Office and play with chords and, and, and solos and scales and things like that on my acoustic guitar. And again, it, I don't know that that makes the movie great. It just made me want to do it. And and. and for for people who are this far into the episode, you already heard the interview. There was this you know really cool thing as Sean mentioned about how they play with space and time, where Joseph Gordon Levitt would appear in the in the reality of the moment as the camera would spin, and I don't know, I just loved watching him play guitar. I loved uh, there was a there was a line in the film that really that has stuck with me since I saw it, which was this concept of you know he plays these three chords. And then he goes, let me do those three chords again, but with 20 years of emotion added to them. It's the same chords, but you're hearing it completely differently because I'm playing it differently. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with filmmakers. You have the same tools. It's just the voice that gets put on that. This movie struck that again in me. And and it was just a, you know, I, I, I needed that. I'm glad I'm playing my acoustic guitar again. It's just been sitting in here. And um, so that being said to the critical side of the filmmaking, I, I, I love this movie. Um, I don't think the songs, at least from my opinion, were meant to be the powerhouses that Sing Street and things like that. Like you said, it's, it's a learning perspective. It's also more of a relationship perspective between a mother and a, a son and how different their musical tastes are and then how mm-hmm. they combine those two together. And I think Eve Hewson is incredible in the movie. There's a her character arc is amazing. Her chemistry with Joseph Gordon Levitt's amazing. Jack Reiner's amazing, as you mentioned. Little the actor who plays the son is fantastic. Um and I think John Carney is just a 
there's a soul to this movie. It just feels like it has a soul to it. It doesn't feel like lifeless. It feels like there's a beautiful soul to it and music. Oh yeah. All his films and, do. He yeah, brings just, that. Did you get that same feeling off of like begin again? Cause I thought begin again really had that too. I don't know. And again, this goes back to the, to the point we make on the show all the time. Like the movies don't change, but we do. Right. So yeah. when I saw begin again, or I saw once, or I saw sing street, I might not have been in the right place to hear that at that time. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. It's very good. I really loved it. And it just personally hit me. Yeah. I think we all highly recommend it. So definitely check out Flora and Son, which is available now. Uh, as is Gareth Edwards' follow up to Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And I'm not joking. It's not like he had another one or two movies in between uh, Rogue One and this one. This is legitimately the next movie he's making since Rogue One. Uh, and talks about, has talked about in interviews, you know, what took him so long to essentially. Uh, come up with a follow-up and and you would assume getting a star wars movie that you would have offers galore but this is a guy who was coming off of back-to-back uh godzilla and then rogue one so dealing very heavily with the pressures that come with franchise directing uh and getting those successful franchises off the ground and and also trying to get his voice in there after coming out with that independent film monsters which i think had a lot of the type of storytelling that he wants to do he is back now with the creator which is getting uh reviews or commercials all over the place and reviews and quotes from a good friend of ours brandon davis calling it the best movie of the year and a lot of other people saying um get out and support original science fiction i'm gonna let you guys go with this one because you i think you both like it more than i did um and jakey i'll start with you uh how did you feel about the creator what worked for you about it um would you recommend it uh loved the film um really felt very sort of lived in them shooting on locations i think really helped ground this very sort of like fantastical world <laughs> uh, i do think it has something really interesting to say about i mean it's easy to look at the movie from the trailers and sort of say, well, of course, a movie about artificial intelligence and robots is coming out right now because that's mm. obviously, you know, you know, a, a big point in the in the, the strikes that we have going on and, and just a big you know conversation point in general. I do think it has a lot of interesting things to say that people aren't going to expect in regards to our artificial intelligence, um, which uh, I'll just leave it there. But the visuals, I think, are so unbelievable. The special effects I mean, the whole point of good special effects is not for you to look at that and go, oh, my God, look at all those special effects. It's for you to forget that the special effects are there to, to kind of become a part of the world. I love those things. Yeah. You guys know what I'm talking about at the end of the year when they do sort of the reels for for Oscar voters. And it kind of shows, look at all the different special effects that we did in this movie that maybe you didn't even realize. I, I love those Wall things. Street did yes, that. Wolf Wall like, Street is always what I think about. There's so That's, many visual effects in that so, movie. And it's, it's such a reminder insane. of like, it's not just the big Marvel movies or Star Wars. There are a lot of times other films. And there's so many great special effects sequences in this that really feel like this this young actress looks like she has a freaking hole in her head. Like it just, it just looks it's kind real. Of it looks easy addition because there's a lot of characters who have that yeah but it's flawless every time it's unbelievable yeah. it's unbelievable <laughs> it's and, really you know, i i you know and, this is yeah. the, the whole concept is is a very sort of your if you're familiar with with lone wolf and cub or a little bit more modern day obviously road to perdition being a, a really big example of that or logan with you know i i, lo I love that sort of sub genre of movies like a sort of a more you know, grumpy adult having to take on a, a young child and go on in sort of this dangerous road trip. I I have always loved that subgenre. Obviously, you know, I, I won't shut up talking about Road to Perdition, uh, which is a, an amazing example of the whole lone wolf and cub sort of aspect of it. The last of us. Did you mention the yeah, last of us? Yeah, the, last, the of last of us. Last of us is a perfect example. Um, I, I just, I love those. So this sort of very much feeds into my wheelhouse. If I had to complain about anything, and I feel like this is maybe a compliment more than anything, uh, it really, needed to be 20 to 30 minutes longer. Um, and what I mean by that is without getting into too much, there was a moment in the film where I thought, all right, we're, we're wrapping up. This is the, wow, what a, what a movie, man. This is the, you know, this is what a, what a great, exciting end to a big action sequence. Like, all right, they're kind of tying it up and then pausing and going, wait, we're, we got a whole, we got a whole other action sequence that you're bringing in. And that sort of final action sequence, the final act, if you will, just moves so fast, especially compared to the pace that the rest of the film moves at. 
that it almost felt like, oh my God, like what, what, uh, slow down. Like where, where did this come from? And I really wouldn't have minded another 20 to 30 minutes in that final act to kind of match the rest of the film because it just, that not only is there, there's so many aspects of that final act that are so different than everything else in the film. The fact that it moves so much faster as well just makes it almost feel this feels more dismissive than it is tacked on that. I just felt like, oh, my God, like just breathe for a second, breathe, bring it back down to where you were. So it's one of the few movies this year at a time where people are complaining about movie length that I'm also going dude. I wouldn't have minded a two and a half hour cut, a 240 cut of this. I movie. was going to say I could do th- depending because because you're not wrong i agree with you thinking about it more about the ending but i had texted you afterwards and i yeah. had the same thought of like i'll take an extra 20 minutes but i wanted it at the beginning interesting like the, interesting the way, it, mm. the way it begins is fine it's not yeah. necessarily like a criticism of like it 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 takes me out of it it just so much happens at the beginning to mm-hmm. get you like any original sci-fi has to set up the world and then set up the characters and then you can take off that sort of tempo always rubs me the wrong way or always feels, you know, a little mm. off. And sure. because the characters are so good, I go looking back, I was like, I would have loved 20 more minutes, mm. another half hour of learning about those characters connections sure. before we jumped off. Sure. It's so yeah, good. I mean, the original cut was like five hours. He said, um, which what, is, is what did he tell you? Exactly. What did he tell you about the, the original cut? I think he just said it. He said the original cut was five hours. And I think, cause I was asking him, I was asking Gareth about, it was it was like more of like a newsy question. It was basically like, you know, how weird is it to be turning on the news and seeing aspects of your storytelling happening in real life and not, you know, with the strikes and all these things sure. like that and artificial intelligence. We mentioned the WGA strike came to an end. If you get a chance, anybody out there listening, read the read what they what they did. The they AI, won. They, they won. The AI time. part. But the AI part is wild yeah. to read. It's a really, really interesting part of it. Do you do you think DGA is looking as a sidebar? Do you think DGA is looking at the WGA contract going, son of a bitch? <laughs> I saw look, someone, look at all the things we could have gotten. Yeah, I did see. A, I saw a tweet. This one like did a meme about that. But oh, really? um, a couple things I want to bring up more on a technical perspective. Then I'll get to the emotional stuff. This film was shot essentially on a consumer prosumer camera. Um, it's an FX three, uh, which is a, very, you know, this is, it's not really ne- normally used in, in, in massive feature storytelling like this in terms of these, these, mo- these movies that we're seeing in theaters. Um, the aspect ratio on this movie is one of the most interesting pieces that I found fascinating because this is being released in IMAX. And this is a very, 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 you know, sh- tiny uh, in terms of it being tall, it's way more wide. How did you see it? If you don't mind me inter- interrupting, I saw, I saw it in IMAX. Okay, I saw it in Dolby, and it was good in Dolby. And the IMAX blew my mind because it's not the tall nature of the of the frame; it's how much is in the frame from left to right. Think about like Ben Hur, like the movies that were shot back in the day with those, like you know, those the seventy millimeter. Um, and what's interesting about it is. The ratio in this film is a two seven six, which is the same ratio that 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 Tarantino used on the hateful eight. But these lenses are basically creating essentially such a wide scope. I think he actually ended up shooting it in three five one. So this is kind of cool. So if you're if you're a nerd about this stuff, if you have a screen X theater near where you live, what that means is when you watch the movie, there's screens on the left and right side of the actual theater. that are not walls they're screens. And they did, this actually happened in Top Gun, too, because they had the footage. But because he shot 351, if you go see the creator in Screen X, you're fully engulfed in the image. Um, and that version will be available. And the reason I bring that up is because, generally speaking, I feel like these days we want to go taller and bigger. But it was nice to see someone use a wide frame like that. It was very cool. Um, and I thought that really added to the scope and the scale of it. Also... You know, you could tell it looks like they added 35 millimeter film grain. They shot digitally. But going to Jake's point about the digi- the special effects, it's actually seamless. Like it looks like everything is happening in camera. Like there's it does nothing ever looks CGI. Um, it looks like we're capturing this almost like a documentary style dream of some sort that's like fantastical or some of some of some way um yeah go ahead Gabe uh, well I wanted to plug because this is a good time a bit of a tag team here Sean I haven't even shown you this yet Sean did um an interview with Gareth uh for Cinema Blend in a partnership with with AMC theaters and such and I actually got to cut 
our interview um, for Cinema Blend, which by the time this comes out should be up. And so mm-hmm. I will plug it in there. But he talks a lot about their process and yeah. his approach to VFX. And and Sean was asking him about sort of what he learned from from something like Star Wars and Godzilla and then going back down to the, you know, his his monsters style and, and sort of taking the best of both worlds. And he explains his he calls it Gorilla VFX. It's a fascinating mm. um conversation and listen and we'll hopefully have him on the show soon but i will plug that as well uh for you guys to check out because i think it's a, it's I, a really good combo and i think uh, from what i understand like they just shot without like markers and stuff I, I need to go back and double check this but like the way that they added in the ilm did the visual effects it was just, it's just really amazing um so i bring that up because if you're questioning whether or not to see it in imax because the aspect ratio is more wide and 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 it's 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 a thinner ratio. Um, it still works shockingly um, because that, that was something I was curious about. Um, now on the other side of this, from a filmmaking standpoint, this is an eighty million dollar film. <laughs> it looks like a three hundred million dollar movie. It really and, does. I, and, it, and again, it looks. We talk about how good the VFX are. I compare it to how uh, to Dune to how Dune just yes. like I never yeah, noticed. Great them. comparison. They, they disappeared. The way 100%. that the, the, you know, the letterboxing disappears when you're watching something, they, the effects just disappeared. Yeah. And the letterboxing disappeared, like the black bars on the top and the bottom yeah, watching exactly. it disappeared because I was so engrossed in like in the, because that's an interesting ratio. Um, so a couple of things in terms of the filmmaking, the emotion of this film, I think is great. And so Gemma Chan and John David Washington are fantastic. I actually love the beginning. I think the beginning, basically the beginning is essentially setting up their relationship in some way and kind of how it factors into the storyline. Um, and I think that if that beginning doesn't work emotionally, you can't build and trust on John David's arc as it, as it progresses emotionally. I think the film just delivers in, in an extreme way. It's like one of the more human films, weirdly enough that I've seen in a long time. And obviously the, the things that are obvious that are connected to the world that we're in now, it kind of feels like a spiritual sequel to Terminator two. And I'll explain oh, this a hundred percent. Yeah, because the so in Terminator 2, if you haven't seen it, obviously Judgment Day. When, who? When, when, who, who, yeah, who's I, listening I to the show? If you're listening to the show. But once the bomb goes, you know, once the, you know, the nuclear holocaust happens, uh, essentially, or, you know, what, yeah, and, you know, what happens to the world post. I think of this being kind of OK, so let's say the bomb goes off. You know, and, you know, destroys, you know, essentially whatever part of the world that the bomb is dropped in. And then this is where we are. And now we're dealing with a human story, kind of like a John Connor Terminator, even though now it's John David Washington and a very young AI. Um, But they're teaching each other, in my opinion, how to be more human, which is basically the Terminator 2 plot. In my opinion, the emotional plot of T2 is is. Arnold's arc to becoming slightly more human, which to the the line at the end, I know now why you cry just hits so perfectly because it's a subtle arc. Um, but yeah, I, John David, I, I think I want to shout him out. Great actor. Obviously, we love them in Tenet and Black Klansman. Um, Gemma Chan's great Bring in this the show. Yeah. And it, it's a couple times. It, yeah. Oh, Allison Janney. She's great. Awesome. I mean, that's interesting. I actually feel like Janney was miscast. I oh, saw someone think? compare her yeah. to Ripley. I was like that. I could see that. I could see it in Aliens in the second I'm, Aliens. I'm more compared her to uh, Stephen Lang's character from Avatar, who's kind of who's kind of over, the, over the topping it. A I can bit, see that. A little bit I, over the I don't it. disagree, but I think it's very subtle. But if you and I guess I won't say because it kind of comes later, but. The moment where she says why she's invested in what yes, they're doing. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. You, you, and you Every time to that it. I thought what you guys thought where I was like, is that a little too? And then I go, well, right. maybe she's just fucking pissed. You know, like that's a little bit what's bugging me about it still is that I, and, and maybe this is a point of the movie, but I, it, it pulled me out of it is that I was never 100 percent sure which way through you're supposed to root um, like initially you are supposed to assume yeah that that um ai is evil and humanity is this is the last ditch to fend off our extinction essentially which when you're given that opportunity you're like all right i'm gonna root for the humans because i wouldn't want to see the human race go extinct 
Um, but then John David Washington has several conflicts throughout, which I'll leave for people to discover that you kind of alternate your allegiances with him. And then the introduction of the weapon, which you've, if you've seen the trailer, you know, you know, resembles a little girl plays with you also, because then you're like, all right, well, which way am I sort of going? Um, and I, I think there are times where the movie wants to be ambiguous about it. And then there are times where the movie clearly wants you to feel one way or the other. And I, I don't know if it always had me. Uh, going the way that it was supposed to go. I'm going to echo everything the guys have said about the third the third act. I have a really hard time excusing it because there's a moment when it happens where from that point moving forward, I was just like, this movie needs to slow down. Um, and I'll tell you about it when we can get into spoilers. And I'll just plug that um, we are hoping to get Gareth Edwards on the show, a hashtag if it happens uh, next week, and we'll be able to do a full spoiler chat with him um, and bring up some of these these topics and it hopefully is booked, dive into it. But we know how hashtag if it happens goes. It's booked. Yeah. <laughs> but shout out to him for what he does with his low budget. This is an eighty million dollar film, and like mm-hmm. Oppenheimer was only a hundred. I say only because you know indie costs three hundred million. You know, and so like you got to think about these filmmakers and what they're able to do with lower budgets. It's seamless visual effects. The visual effects in this look better than Quantumania. They just do. Oh God, yes! 100%. And that movie costs yeah. so much more. Well, better, better, and better than the Flash. Flash, yeah, looked looks embarrassing. better than the Flash. Yeah. yeah, the the chroma key that we use for our meteorologist on our morning show looks better than most of the oh, stuff in Quantum Mania. Settle down. No, it does, no, Quantum Mania actually looks good. Uh, you can rip on the Flash if you want to, but Quantum Mania looks good. Does it? No, uh, it yeah. does not. It does. No, it really does. does. No, it really does. Quantum Mania looks good. Go you back think and rewatch it. Better than it. the creator. No, no, I no. don't. Is there a movie but. this year that looks better than the creator from visual effects, from from immersion? Honestly, and so- I think especially with Dune out of the picture, I think the creator has a legitimate shot at the Oscar for special effects. I think it does. Wow. And one of the one of the big stories that was floating around that was clarified recently, I think, by one of the people behind the scenes on Oppenheimer. There was a huge story that came out when Oppenheimer came out, which was there's no CGI in the film. And that was debunked because what they're saying is there's no there was no like computer generated imagery put onto the screen. CGI, but you, yeah. but you still use you still use visual effects to basically get rid of like booms and 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 things like that. Or when you're making the bomb explosion, when when you do the Trinity test, that's multiple pieces of things they shot practically that you then have to digitally put together. Essentially, from what I understand, so right. you're still it's, using visual effects. It's a technicality of people use CGI the way people use uh, Kleenex is maybe the wrong analogy, but but they use CGI to explain using a computer to make a movie. <clears throat> but computer generated imagery is using computer to generate simulations to generate these actual Correct. pixels. What you're just what you're describing is compositing, which is right, which is what he does a lot of, which is capturing it's still, real it's still, footage. Still computer, still, but, com- but still it's, using. But it's yeah. actually an old process. I mean, they composite, you know, the right. oldest films that you can think of use right. compositing on film. But right. Gareth also had industrial light and magic to work with. And they right. are some of the best in the business right now. Oh, dude, I- I- ILM, we had to just put this I mean, together. I mean, ILM did. Uh, Terminator uh, 2. Indiana Jones, didn't they, though? I mean, we're talking about that. Like, wasn't it? It had yeah. to be. I think so. It had to be ILM, right? I'm sure. They they did T2. And like, that's what's interesting. You go back and look at T2. I've said this before on the show, but that movie looks like it could be made, come out today. But you think about the ILM. ILM did Pacific Rim. I watched that the other night. That looks phenomenal. But I mean, it's interesting how some movies can look really good, but ILM is also doing all the current Star Wars TV shows, which look like TV shows. Right. Well, I think the difference is what Gareth... Again, what you get with the aspect ratio with Gareth's movie is you have a you have such a wide frame well, that you're you're not like you're not honed in on a massive you know one nine zero one four three IMAX. He's, also, he's going on location. It's he's more filming compl- on right. location. I think it's a little more. It's more complicated than that. In that uh, VFX isn't simple. I know that that's a simple thing to say, but one you talk about this in your conversation with him. Gareth Edwards comes from VFX, so he's having a filmmaker. Not having a VF, you know, they have a VFX supervisor on this, but having a filmmaker, your director knows what he needs because he knows how to work on it. That's a huge thing is Mm -hmm. it could be we're going to get this shot and then we'll quote unquote fix it in post or we're going to do this. You have to have someone there that can say if we were to do it this way, slightly differently, we can make it look realistic. So it's not that ILM is doing anything differently. It's just that there's budget, there's time and there's who's actually picking the shots and, and, and who's, who's winning those arguments about how they should shoot it to that dictate how good something looks. And I think 
from the conversations I've heard him have heard him have for Gareth, it was very much a I know my limitations, and so I'm going to shoot and write to those limitations, and it mm. and then what you get is something that looks flawless. I think, and then you add the thirty, you add like a film grain, and you can really kind of the world just becomes that. Uh, it just becomes that, yeah. and also what's fascinating, and I want to ask Gareth this when if if it happens when we have him on, um, you bring up the shots of seeing through the whole of the AI's heads. That's probably done through plates, right? So you you that's you what would I'm probably, curious about because plates seems time consuming, it, though. Right. I, you know? that, that's that's my question because yeah. for people who don't know how that works, like one of the most best examples I ever saw of of plates being used in cinema was the first Captain America, because Chris Evans would shoot those scenes. Of, uh, you know, when he was like larger, but then they would literally shrink him down with CG. And when you shrink someone down, the space behind them appears. So if you shrink me down right now, more of these movies behind me would appear. So in order to make it look realistic, you have to shoot the scene once with Chris. Then you Chris leaves the scene. You shoot it plain, which I think is the plate. plate I believe yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. And then basically through the computer, you're able to put that plate in and the shot looks, you know, it's really cool how they do it. So my assumption, but to Gabe's point, that's what I want to ask Gareth. There's so many scenes. No, I think my guess would be that it's a green screen addition to the back of their head. Yeah, but 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 remember, you're seeing through. How, what do you fill it with? That's the question. Right. Yeah. Do right. they, so are they right. using a so plate if, to fill it like Kevin's if describing? If I turn this they, way right now and, and I had a hole in my head, you would see these movies behind me right now. You can't. No, I right? understand so that. Then, yeah. So you would film it. And then I would step back in, shoot it again. And then in post, you basically you the, the hole you create and then then you put that plate in the background. So it's out. But the question is, this is an 80 million dollar film and there's a lot of those. So they would have had they would you basically have to shoot the scene twice. Right, Gabe, in order to get a plate, essentially. Right. Uh, uh, kinda. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't say that I know exactly how they did it. And I assume they yeah. had their their methods. I mean, maybe there's a quick way to do it. To me, it's just when you're talking about shooting a plate. I think of time consuming of not only you have to do another shot, but also you're talking right. about it limits the way that you can move your camera or limits the way that you have to like uh, the equipment you have to use to move your camera consistently. Yeah. At least as far as I know, I haven't worked on an $80 million movie, but <laughs> what we do is uh, we use paper plates to keep. Cost <laughs> there we go. There no, we but go. I, I really want to ask Gareth this. So if you're tuning into our show, we'll hopefully have Gareth on. And that's something I really want to know, because that's that's a really tough thing to pull off, especially for low budget. Jake, you wanted to give your thoughts on Saw X. Uh, yeah, I really liked it a lot, which I feel like says a lot for any franchise where you're talking about the 10th installment uh, of, a, of a series, um, much less an installment that I've kind of given up on within the past few years. I haven't truly liked a Saw movie probably since the original trilogy, which if you're familiar with the story, kind of tells its own story. And then four clearly is a signal that they're just going to kind of keep going with the franchise. But this one feels fresh. It's got a really interesting storyline. It takes place between the first and second Saw films. It takes place just a couple of days after the first Saw ends. That's cool. I, was, that's, I like cool. that they're doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Um, and it, it it relies heavily on uh, getting to know uh, John, getting to know the the man who is Jigsaw. Tobin Bell has a lot more to do in this. Uh, basically, basically revolves around him kind of getting suckered into these people who trick him into thinking that they can remove the cancer from his brain so he goes to this sort of resort <laughs> in mexico only to learn that they duped him and stole his money and left and he uh has a way of tracking them down and putting them in uh his his iconic traps and his making them come to terms his iconic his iconic traps have you wait have you seen it no, but I've seen oh, okay. that the, okay. there's a promo yeah. image of like yeah, that's, that's sort of the icon. Yeah, exactly. Um, there are some pretty grisly traps that make you sort of go like, ah, uh, but it's also like it's also it got a surprisingly good story. Like you're you're in it because of what happened to this guy, like this poor man who like, yes, he's jigsaw and we know the sort of things that he ends up doing and has done. But at the end of the day, he's still like an old man with cancer who they stole money from. And you can't mm. help but feel feel bad for him, which really the fact that you were given a new perspective on a character that you've seen, you know, so many times is pretty incredible. So I, I really liked it. You know, I I'm a, I know I'm a horror fan, but I'm also a, a horror fan who had given up on this franchise. And for the first time in a very long time, I'm actually going, all right, like. 
if you're if you can find a way to to, to you know to do this, I'm I'm back in. It sounds like this is the case, but if I've if I haven't seen anything but maybe those first three, is this a good time to come back in, or is it like this? this yeah, there's there's one there's one sort of twist and payoff that I gotta be honest with you, kind of went over my head because I sort uh. of had to pause and go, wait, who the hell was that? Like, who was that in the context of? Because I think it, it's a character that came a little bit later, or maybe I don't have the encyclopedic knowledge of of the Saw franchise that that is required. But it just sort of felt like. Um, it, it, it didn't take away from it. it just sort of made me go man i wish i wish i could remember who that character was interesting yeah um but beyond that i i was i was in man and i, I gotta be honest like i think a lot of us walked into that going all right let's 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 see how this goes and yeah. uh and i was i was very pleasantly very pleasantly surprised i had a great time you and, 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 saw and it is the, how it went oh, hey. <laughs> kevin you know, one of my favorite jokes from the office is uh is when uh ryan goes to to dwight and says uh okay like because they're trying to make a plan he goes did you do you, did you see saw and he goes of course i see saw i see saw with Moe's all the time and he's like no did you see the movie so it's such a stupid little line and i realized that the junket that no one else had seen that or remembered that because i tried to use that junket or that line at the junket with all the other reporters and everyone was like i don't know what you're talking about that that sounds like an homage to sandlot when he's like do you want a s'more yeah, and you do want a s'more to s'more what I want to point out also that this week, uh, Craig Gillespie's movie, Dumb Money, is finally expanding wide. Um, Sony, why didn't you go wide from the get go? You could have been kicking Expendables ass and chipping into the nun, too. And now you're coming out against uh, a a big creator and saw and other other Paw Patrol and these other films that are opening. I I don't understand why they waited on Dumb Money. I feel like that movie had heat coming off of Toronto you know, uh, people were curious to see what it was about. It went limited. It did OK in limited theaters. Um, it had pretty high per theater average, but it's going wide. And now we reviewed that film during its platform release a couple of weeks ago. And of course, you can find uh, we did have Craig Gillespie on the show to talk about the um, the filming of Dumb Money. And that is episode number 279. So if you're checking Dumb Money out this weekend, please go back afterwards and listen to our interview with Craig after that. All right, quick mention. Um, oh, I want to mention really quick. Uh, th- this past week, uh, right before we recorded, uh, based on Jake's recommendation and also just from all the buzz that was happening around, I finally caught Brian Duffield's uh, No One Will Save You with Caitlin Deaver, who is unbelievably good. Um, it, people use the Amblin, you know, excuse uh, Amblin uh, description all the time. I, I think it's dark Amblin. <laughs> um, it it has it's it's like Spielberg circa Close Encounters, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So it's even before his ET phase and 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 true full blown Amblin, where he got into like families. This is like you're you're the characters are in danger <laughs> you don't feel like uh that they're gonna get through what's happening to them uh on screen it's a tight tight 93 minutes it looks amazing it's incredibly well shot um it it is a huge huge recommend for me uh definitely watch it's on hulu streaming on hulu it's called no one will save you uh, and we have, and we just completed it, so we can tease this, a full-on spoiler chat with uh, director Brian Duffield coming to the show very soon, where we're going to get into huge specifics for it. So make sure that you have seen No One Will Save Us before we get to no that interview. You. No One Will Save You. You. Well, yeah, Us is going to be the sequel. That's okay. Right. Yeah. It's a yeah. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just got that scoop, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Call to action. Head down to the comments. We want to hear from you guys. Let us know your favorite saw trap um uh, kevin and jake have their favorites they will reveal it uh in the comments down below the youtube channel i'll give you a hint it has something to do with needles uh in the meantime you can follow us on social media yeah, until we come back it's kind of the needle one it's kind of the needle one yeah hands down the, the 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 scene that made me squirm in my seat the most it's funny it's like it's the needle one for oh. saw and it's the logs for final <clears throat> destination yeah like, but you mentioned those franchises the, yeah, the, and that's I, I just, if I drive, that. yeah if i drive by a log truck which i don't do in, in Chicago, but in texas yeah there i always think of the all right, social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode, and as promised, plenty more uh, interviews, maybe a couple of shots from Daenerys sneaking into uh, the frame. So head to the YouTube channel to watch that. 
And uh, until next week, pay your actors. Pay your actors. Pay your actors. actors. And the man who moved the earth, always.